Where did it all go wrong, Boris? Where did it all go wrong? A Brexit manifesto with an 80-seat majority should have been an unstoppable force for change. But instead, we got a half-cocked Brexit deal and no government reforms whatsoever. Indeed, the only reforms we saw making the rounds were all aimed at appeasing lefties instead of delivering what Brexiters expected. And don't give us the red wall as an excuse. They wanted the Brexit stuff, not the crypto commie stuff. We don't want your draconian online harms bill, and we don't give a stuff about sending a couple of token foreigners to Rwanda. How about something positive, like investing in fish processing plants so British fishermen do not need to land their catches in French ports? How about not forcing established farmers off their land? You know the folk, the ones that put food on our tables. And how about not being buck-broken globalists that actively work against our national interests? So there we have it, that impressive 80-seat majority spaffed up the wall because they were all too busy sticking their thumbs up each other's asses instead of getting the job done. Sure, Boris was making gaff after gaff, but we weren't going to sweat the small stuff. You deliver your post-Brexit pledges, and we would stand with you, Boris, yes, we would stand with you, warts and all. But suddenly, things changed. Brexit promises were off the priority list as the desire to please Carrie and her commie chums took over. Dominic Cummings was fired, so the much-needed civil service reform would no longer go ahead. In other words, all previous plans screeched to a halt. Boris realised that so long as Brexit remained incomplete, he could rely on a healthy degree of support from Brexiters. At least that was the case until it started becoming more obvious that Boris was dragging his heels. His refusal to trigger Article 16, then looking for alternative approaches outside the treaty that would run a very high risk of breaching international law. I was going to do a Brexit update on this very topic, but it would most likely be irrelevant by the time we have a new Prime Minister. Okay, so let's strip away the bullshit and examine the real reason Boris was ousted, and why he was ousted now. As previously indicated, Boris was in a state of constant low-level gaffes, and yes, not all were harmless, but equally, none were so big that the Tories could not tolerate them. And yet we're supposed to believe Boris giving his groping friend a second chance was the end of the world. And not only that Boris must go immediately, but he must be gone with no chance of being able to do anything out of spite as some sort of parting shot. Something never before said of any previous Prime Minister, and more something taken from the Trump hysteria handbook. Boris felt a sense of security. His gaffes and clowning were being tolerated. Tories were perfectly happy to sit back and do nothing with their 80-seat majority. And don't give me COVID as an excuse. Even with COVID, they could have pushed through everything. With an 80-seat majority, they could have pushed through their entire manifesto, even with COVID. But at the end of the day, they could just blame it all on Boris if people started asking questions. It wasn't the best of times, but there was enough food in the trough to keep the pig satisfied. But then the unthinkable happened. Keir Starmer, that useless lump also known as the leader of the opposition, stood up and said something sensible. Not necessarily believable, but just as credible as anything the Tories had said for a while. Starmer was talking about Labour's new post-Brexit vision. No longer is he talking about rejoining the EU, and he's talking seriously about getting a permanent solution for Northern Ireland. What if the voters take him seriously and believe him? Where will they be if Starmer wins back the Red Wall? The Tories panicked, and in the chaos, they latched onto the latest gaffe by Boris and used it to generate a media frenzy that would drown out any talk of Labour's post-Brexit vision. Okay, so why get rid of Boris? Why not just generate the storm in the Westminster bubble and then let it blow over? As I indicated in my previous Brexit videos, it was always part of the plan to get rid of Boris and replace him with a Prime Minister that was meant to implement the post-Brexit vision. Just to be clear, what I'm talking about is how it is. I'm not talking about how I want it to be. 
I do not want this clusterfuck any more than the next guy. But the original plan can best be summarised as follows. Boris Johnson, the face of Brexit. He was to do his thing and be popular. Michael Gove, the administrator. He was to get the hard work done while everyone was being entertained by Boris. And then there was Dominic Cummings, the henchman. He was to reform the civil service and cut out the rot. And waiting in the wings as a bright new up-and-comer, Rishi Sunak, to replace Boris as the long-term post-Brexit Prime Minister. A World Economic Forum guy. Competent, but also easy to control. This was the plan since before Boris was Prime Minister. The thing we don't know is why Boris sacked Dominic Cummings. I know we all say it's because of Carrie and her commie ways, but Boris is hardly a true blue Tory himself. Perhaps it's as simple as Boris refusing to go peacefully when it was time for him to be replaced. All he needs to do is fire Cummings, sideline Gove, Boris is Prime Minister and there's nothing they can do to stop him. Maybe that's what happened. Who knows? But the falling out was real enough. We just don't know precisely the why. And since then, Dominic Cummings and Michael Gove have been drip-feeding embarrassing leaks to the media about Boris. Without them... The media wouldn't really have too much to go on over the past couple of years. If we run with the theory that Boris went rogue when it was time for him to step aside, then this coup-like manoeuvre by the cabal can be seen as them getting rid of their rogue asset. Suddenly, a trivial statement from Boris is a step too far. The Tories cannot stomach another potential lie from him and they start resigning in their droves. This is not an organic occurrence, but has been carefully orchestrated by Michael Gove. Boris then sacks Gove, but cannot avoid the takedown, and so we find ourselves in the middle of another Tory leadership contest. As far as I can see, the plan is still to get Rishi Sunak installed as Prime Minister. The problem with this is that he's a World Economic Forum bot who has zero empathy. He works to the 80-20 rule, so he cannot comprehend why people would complain when 20% of the population get fucked if 80% of the population is fine. The backup plan appears to be Penny Mordaunt, another World Economic Forum bot but with a veneer, a thin veneer of empathy. A strong supporter of the LGBT agenda and... She said in interview that she approves of the online harms bill. Her voting history shows that she has voted against every single measure designed to help disabled people. So if you think her veneer of empathy is real, think again. Interestingly, true Brexiteers such as Jacob Rees-Mogg and Nadine Doris are supporting Liz Truss, a Remainer who became a Brexit zealot after the fact. She appears to be genuinely trying to make the best of the situation, albeit as stated in a previous video, she is well-meaning, but her skill set is limited. So this brings me to a more personal question. If Dominic Cummings is such a globalist, then why have I been supporting his Machiavellianism? Well, you've heard the expression there's more than one way to skin a cat, but in our case you could perhaps say, we have more than one cat to skin. There's the communists, and there's the globalists. We will never be in a position to weed out the commies embedded within our institutions. That's what we need Dominic Cummings for. He had the globalist backing that gave him the clout to get the job done. You see, the people think commies in our institutions is some sort of a trope or joke, not something that they will get sufficiently angry about to actually do something over. That's where the Cummings purge is required. But if we look to our neighbours in the Netherlands, what's happening right now, people can see the globalists as a genuine threat to their preferred way of life, and they are able to get angry enough to do something about it. Then when folk want to find out what's going on, people like the World Economic Forum have their plans publicly available to be read by all, and so all can see that it's not a trope, it's not some crazy conspiracy theory. What they're saying is what they're trying to force on everyone. So basically, my thought was for Cummings to purge the commies, then the people put down the globalists if they can. If they cannot, of course, then their freedom was never achievable anyway, but at least we would have fought for it. The problem now, of course, is that Dominic Cummings was stopped from purging the institutions, so the commies are all still there. 
I predict the globalists will try to use the commies as their brown shirts, a bit similar to how leftists themselves think they can control Muslims to be their henchmen. It might look workable on paper, but when reality strikes, things will get complicated rather quickly. I don't know what will happen next. I'm just clinging on for the ride, hoping the disaster bus stops at a nice spot where our glorious civilization can continue. But make no mistake, whether it's commies or globalists doesn't make a massive difference to me. What I mean by that is both groups want to bleed us dry and leave us with nothing. But why I err on the side of the globalist, more so than the communist, is because the commie operates via infiltration and deception, whereas the globalist does his deeds in the open. So we can at least see who's who, and so we have a better chance of exerting small amounts of leverage in our favour. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.